just going to go kind of right into it because we know, you know, some people still got work, I guess. But um, <laughs> we have a guest speaker, Dan Bohai, and I met him in 2008 at New Life Church, and it radically changed my life. Um, I thought it was all about the Father, Son, and whole, just Holy Bible, but I had just the supernatural encounter with the Lord that he's actually here. It's not just a theology or just a principle. It's actually the presence of God is here now. And I remember after that um, meeting at the youth group, I'm driving back to my school and college and I said, God, whatever that guy has, I want. And it's really just the presence of God. It was the anointing of the Lord. And um, so, we're, yeah, we're just honored to have you here. And he's been traveling for, what, 12 years? And you've done how many meetings? About 1,200 meetings in 12 years. So that's only about 100 meetings a year. You know, not too bad. <laughs> and seeing about like 73,000 miracle healings. And, and so, I mean, I don't know how we got you here, but we're just thankful that you're here. <laughs> you, yeah, you gave me a call. I know, I'm just joking. I'm messing around. Um, but yeah, let's go up for Dan Bohai and... Um, And we want to bless, you know, Dan, and, you know, he has books that are available. And we just want to take up the offering real quick. Um, he has to drive back to Kansas in a couple days. And so if you guys have your check, you can write out to Pearl Chapel, but we want to also give him a check. We combine those together. And uh, is that okay with you, Dan? Okay. And so let me just pray over the offering. Last Wednesday, we actually kind of forgot to do the offering, so we're not going to forget this time because you weren't here. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, but Lord, we just thank you that you're the provider, and we just thank you for every person here that there will be more than enough provision in Jesus' name. We just ask for just a, a, just a double portion back for everyone that gives in your name. Amen. Okay, well, let's welcome up Dan Bohai right now. I'll get the stool for you. Okay. I have a couple books that I've written. The first one's called Holiness and Healing. I believe God can make your heart pure, and I believe God can heal your emotions and your body. I believe he's a God of holiness and healing. And I think his holiness work is the eternal healing. If he heals everybody tonight of all your physical problems, unless Jesus comes back, you're still going to die. If he, if he heals you spiritually, it could last for eternity. Come on. So I believe in holiness and healing. And, and uh, uh, on the top of this cover, it, Randy Clark says, I recommend all who are pursuing kingdom ministry to absorb the message of this book. So it's a good book. Uh, it's in, we're in our sixth printing of this. We've sold a lot of these. And then I have a brand new book that came out this week. I started it a year and a half ago, and it takes a long time, especially with COVID, to get stuff done. But it's God's timing. This book is called Identity, Who You Are in Jesus Christ and Why It Matters. And I think it gives people courage and confidence to walk bold in faith in these times that we're in. It's a brand new book. just came out this week. They're $20 a piece, but if you buy them both, I do them for 30 And I take credit cards, whatever. So you can see me after the service. Is that okay? Yes. So... <clears throat> Yeah, Pearl Chapel. The gates into heaven are pearls. Isn't that interesting? And pearls are made from irritation and pressure. Everybody loves the finished product. Nobody wants to go through it. But God's trying to turn us all into pearls. Amen? But I want to tell you something. It's interesting. The Lord told me this as I was just sitting here. I looked up these names the foundations that hold the 12 gates into heaven are all the names of the sons of Israel. And I just want to go through those with you right quick before I preach as an introduction. Is that okay? Um, in Genesis chapter 29, if I can see, I'm getting older. Nobody here gets older, right? On the Central Coast, you don't age. Well, in Kansas, we age. Okay. Um, but I, I just I studied the names uh, once, and I just 
The Holy Spirit brought it to me tonight. It's interesting. I wasn't even thinking about this. And so here's the first son that was born to Jacob. The first son was Reuben. And Reuben's Hebrew name means to see a son. And so when you're really born again, people can see a difference. You can't be a secret Christian. You can't be a closet Christian. In other words, there's evidence. You stop doing things. You start wanting things. Come on. Are you guys with me? So the first name that's the gate into heaven is that there's an obvious transformation that they see it. And that's what Reuben means. Okay? The second son was um, Simeon. Now, that's interesting. Simeon means to hear or to have conversation with. And what happens when you're born again? You start talking to God. You start listening to God. You actually have communion with God. Imagine that. He listens. Imagine that his kids can hear his voice. Come on. And so that's what Simeon means, to hear. Isn't that awesome? Okay, the third son, this, it, it gets better, is Levi. Now, Levi means the holy ones or to be attached to or to be at one with. Okay, so the first son is the gate. The first gate is you're born again, you can see a son. The second gate is you can hear. Now you start having a conversation with the one who let you have new life. But the third name means holy one or one with holiness, which means the sanctification gate. Not just born again to get your sins forgiven, but to get cleansed and purified and made holy. Come on, Jesus prayed for his disciples that they would be one with him, just as him and the Father are one. You guys get that? Well, that's what Levi means. I thought you guys would be more excited. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Come on. Then the next, the next son born is Judah, which means praise. Now, if you're a really born-again Christian and there's evidence because people can see a change and you're having an ongoing communication prayer life with Jesus and you're, your heart's pure and you're one with God, what's your life going to be? Praise. All the time, overflowing with praise. Do you guys get it? Do you guys, don't you like the sequence? Aren't you glad God doesn't do things by chance? The next son is the son, uh, the gate, Daniel which means to make judgments or discern. Now, you have to be a real Christian that has an ongoing prayer life where you've not just allowed God to forgive you, but you've allowed him to cleanse you and fill you and make you one with him so you have a life of worship and praise, so you live in the presence of God, so you can start seeing the inequities and injustices on this planet the way God sees them. Daniel means to make judgments based on God's criteria instead of your own agenda. It's in that order, by the way. <laughs> the, the next son born is the son Naphtali. And that Hebrew name means you have to wrestle through things. What forces a, a Christian to wrestle in intercession when they see the inequities and the things that are wrong in the world? They can see the injustices. Come on, they can see the, the evil They can see the abortion. Come on, they can see stuff. And it makes them wrestle. Well, that's what the next name means, to wrestle with God. This isn't even the message. This is the This is not the message. Then then the next the next son, listen to this. The next son is the Gad. The name Gad, which means your fortune. You get a fortune. When you wrestle with God, God rewards those who diligently keep seeking him. And the word gad means fortune. Come on. Is it God who gives you the power to get wealth so we can establish his covenant on the earth? Come on. Okay. Okay, listen to this. The next gate is the Asher gate. You know what that means? You're happy. Come on. Okay, so you become a son. And there's evidence. You become one who talks to God continually because you like the one that just brought you into the family. And you like him so much, you start trusting him enough that he changes your nature and makes you one so you and him are one. And then you have a life of overflowing praise. 
And then he lets you start seeing things like he sees them and it makes you wrestle. But when you wrestle, he rewards you with your fortune. Come on. And the result is you're happy. Okay. <laughs> Yay. This, this, maybe, maybe I'll end on this one. Come on. So the, then the next gate is the Issachar gate. And Issachar means your wages. In other words, you start getting what God knows you deserve. It's your wages. That's what Issachar means. If you live a life of overflowing joy and you're happy, God rewards you. Come on. No, well, when do I get my break? When's God going to give me my breakthrough? He doesn't reward that. He's looking for people that actually trust him. I'm preaching better than you're acting. So <laughs> then, then, yeah. the, next, the next son born is Zebulun. This is, this is amazing. Zebulun, Hebrew name, means it becomes the dwelling place. It's actually a picture of a home with shade trees, a hammock, a little creek, little vineyard. In other words, if you progress in these gates, your life ends up becoming the place where God doesn't visit, but he dwells in you and you in him and you have your being in him and he has his being in you. And it's a picture of a satisfied soul. Yay. And then the next gate born is Joseph which really means he takes away all your reproach. So you have nothing, no condemnation, guilt, or shame, and you become this supernatural energized being that can leap over tall walls like a Superman. That's what Joseph means. And then the final one born was uh, born, the only child born in the promised land. The 12th son was the only one born in God's destiny for Israel. And when mom was given birth to the boy, she died, and she named him Benomai. Benami, and which means dying. <laughs> but it's a prophetic sign because once the mom was dead, the dad changed his name to Benjamin, which means son at my right hand. Now listen, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus who's at the right hand of the Father. And if we die to ourselves and get into the promised land of God's destiny dream for all of us, we die to get into it, but we live forever because now we're seated at the right hand of the Father. Yay. Yay. That's the 12 gates. That's the 12 names of the sons of Israel. And they all are the foundations that hold up the pearls. And this is Pearl Chapel by the sea. God must have had you in mind before you knew you, you were going to do this. Amen? Okay, so I believe in holiness. I believe in healing. I'm going to preach a message tonight on holiness, and tomorrow night I'll preach on the gifts and healing. Um, I'm on a two-month trip right now. I've seen more supernatural miracles than I've ever seen in my life. Ever. Um, Sunday morning at Mercy Church, everybody was, came forward to receive a baptism of the Spirit. I started hearing words of knowledge. People started instantly getting healed. One of the leaders' bicep was totally torn where he couldn't hardly make a, he couldn't, he couldn't do this. And he started crying, and he picked up one of the chairs and started curling it. He goes, look, pastor. And he was instantly healed. God healed his torn bicep. One lady whose knee and shin and ankle were in a brace and she couldn't walk, she threw the brace off and started jumping up and down on her bad leg. She was instantly healed. One lady whose knees were totally destroyed, I said, how do you know they're healed? She goes, well, they don't hurt. I said, well, how do you know they're healed, though? Maybe they don't hurt because you got out of your seat and you're standing. And she goes, well, I don't know. I said, well, jump, can you jump up on the stage? It's like three foot. She jumped up on the stage. I said, do some knee bends. She did. I said, can you run? She goes, I, I haven't been able to run. I said, can you run? She runs back and forth on the stage three times. Instantly, I didn't touch her. Come on. Um, backs, headaches, vision. Just miracle after miracle after miracle. I didn't do it. I just watch him. <laughs> He's, a heal He's the healer. And he lives in me. 
so, but I'm going to preach tonight on a pure heart. Is that okay? Because yes. if without a pure heart, you can't see God, so it's kind of important. Yes. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Come on. Yeah, Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart. Because yeah. they'll see the Lord. Which the connotation would be if your heart's not pure. Come on, are you guys with me? Yes. In 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, 3, it says, this is God's will for you, that you would be sanctified. Why? So you can avoid sexual immorality. Maybe if your eyes were pure enough to see God, you couldn't stand looking at pornography because God would look better. Come on. Why, why is 70% of the church in pornography? Because their hearts aren't pure. Are you guys with me? So have you guys ever read the book of James? James is in your face, isn't he? Come on, you grew up with Jesus as your older brother, you're going to be like really staunch on what you believe. Would you guys agree with that? So I'm going to go through James. I'm going to pick out, I don't know, 8, 10, 12 points that describe a person that loves God, loves church, loves Monday night revival, likes to worship, doesn't want to go to hell, wants to go to heaven, but they're not pure in their heart. They're still divided. I'm going to pull some points out of James that describe a person that loves God, loves church, wants to go to heaven, doesn't want to go to hell, even likes church, but the heart's not yet pure. Would that be okay? Okay, so here, here we go. James chapter 1, verse 8. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Double-minded means double-hearted. Still contaminated, still mixed, not pure, not in solidarity. It's, it's mixed. Double-minded means double-hearted. What's the result? Unstable. So I've never been in so many churches where people love God, love church, want to go to heaven, but their marriages are a mess, their emotions are a mess, their family's a mess, their finances are a mess, their anger's a mess. It's like every area of their life's unstable. And I think eventually, if your heart was pure, all the symptoms of your life would start reflecting what's coming out of your heart. I don't mean you don't have consequences for sin. I'm not stupid. I think we do have some consequences. But eventually, don't you think your life would reflect your heart? I mean, doesn't it say in Proverbs 4, 23, that out of the heart flow 92% of the issues of life. <laughs> I'm trying to test if any of you read the Bible, okay? All the issues of life come out of your heart. So if your heart would be pure instead of divided, don't you think every symptom of your life would start reflecting your heart eventually? Is anybody with me? Yes. If you're mad at me for preaching this message, take it up with James, man. <laughs> I'm stealing the message right out of the Bible. <laughs> So that's point number one. Here's, yay. Here's point, number, here's point number two. Point number two is chapter one, verse 22. And it says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not just hearers who delude themselves. Okay, what's this point mean? I don't think you'd ever do the word until your heart's pure. I think when your heart's still carnal and self-centered and you want what you want sometimes and you want what God wants when it's convenient, I think you're better critic at critiquing people's sermons instead of your life becoming the sermon. Come on, the word do, the word doer is the word poiemo. And it's just the simplest definition would be you perform the script that's been given you. What does that mean? This, this has to become flesh in you. So that what this is, you become. Now, you don't do that until your heart's pure. I'm sorry. You're always needing ministry when everything's unstable. But once your heart's pure, your life becomes ministry. Not just preachers and evangelists and prophets. No, everybody. The royal priesthood. Come on, am I right? Ah, I hate this message. Because it reminds me of me before I got a pure heart. I was an expert churchian. Man, I was a leader in the church. And I didn't do what the Bible says. I just invited people to church. <laughs> Come on. 
I knew how to talk church language and every area of my life was unstable. So that's why I'm telling you, I don't like it, but yet it needs to be preached. Okay, here we go. You guys ready? Can I go on? I promise you I won't give you all 39 points. We'll just cut it to nine or 10. <laughs> Point number three, it, chapter two, verse nine. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin. Partiality, prejudice. Picking and choosing who you'll pour into based on whether you think they can help you back. Is the church guilty of that? Yes. Come on. Now, we have work projects, but people don't want to be a project. People want to be loved. I, I think, until your heart's pure, you pick and choose the people you want to hang around with based on the ones you're comfortable with because they're like you. But when your heart's pure... You see everybody the same. They, you know they all need Jesus. That's why no counties in America ever grow in born-again Christians, you guys, because everybody's always trying to be around the people they're comfortable with. But when your heart's pure, you see what God sees. Come on, man. I'm preaching good. <laughs> Chapter, verse 4. Oh, this is, oh, these, these don't get better. I'm sorry. <laughs> Chapter, Chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 22, point number four. You see that faith was working with his works, and a result, as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Here's point number four. You can love God, love church, love revival, love worship. Come on, you can love small group and Bible study. But until your heart's pure, you don't have any deeds. All you have is faith. Once your heart's pure, you become an instrument of righteousness that doesn't impede the Holy Spirit's progress through you. Come on. I was in the church my whole life until I was 34. I never led anybody to the Lord. I never laid hands on one person and saw a miracle, and I was on the board of a church of 3,000. I had lots of faith with no works. And the moment my heart got pure, I couldn't keep track of the works because it wasn't me. I was now a vessel that he could flow through. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Okay, uh, that was point four. Point five, you ready? Oh boy, should I say this? I'm gonna say it. Chapter three, verse eight, no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. <laughs> point five is this, until your heart's pure, you'll talk one way at work and another way at church. You'll talk one way at home and another way around your friends. You'll talk one way around a certain group of people at church and another way around another group of people at church. At one moment, you'll be singing worship songs and praising God, and the next moment, you'll talk behind someone's back who was created in the image of the God you're praising. One moment, your words will be salty. The next, they'll be fresh water. One moment, they'll be grace. The next, they'll be dead. One time, you'll be speaking life. The next moment, you'll be speaking death. Until your heart's pure, and then your heart always speaks out of the overflow of your heart. Your mouth always speaks out of the overflow of your heart. If your heart's divided, you don't know what's coming out. If your heart's pure, you have a new way of talking. In fact, your language gives you away. People look at you and they hear how you talk. You don't talk to fear. You don't talk depression. You don't talk gossip. You don't talk slander. You talk hope and courage and love and faith and... And they say, well, why do you talk? You sound like a Jesus person. Why do you have hope when everybody else is discouraged? Well, let me tell you, he lives inside of me. And if he can change me, he can change yeah. you. Come on, you guys. Yeah. Good okay, point number six. Verse 14 of chapter three is point number six. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, <laughs> I don't need to go any farther. How many people in the church are selfish and jealous and self-centered, but love's not? Love doesn't seek its own. It, I don't need to go any farther. We need pure hearts. Come on, are you with me? Point number seven, chapter four, verse one. Chapter four, verse one. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your own pleasures that wage war in your own members? So your problem, the problem with the church in America is not that the government tries to rule us. 
It's not that the government says same-sex marriage is the law of the land. It's not that the government approves of abortion. It's not that the government controls taxes. That's not our problem. Our problem is people in the church all have their own heart, so they have their own agendas, and everybody's wanting what they want. But if we all had the same pure heart of Jesus, we'd only want what he wants, and there'd be no more conflicts inside the body. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I love, when you, I love when you smile at me. I love it. You see, I've been to so many churches, and most churches are filled with people that were unhappy at other churches. Most churches are filled with people that weren't satisfied where they were. And if all of us had the heart of Jesus, we wouldn't go to church to be fed church was never designed to be like a feeding trough. We would go to church because we're overflowing with thanksgiving and praise. And we wouldn't critique people's message and say, well, we need to go over there. That guy's not a good, we would, we wouldn't, we would just be glad to have an hour off from performing the word to take a break to hear a message. <laughs> Amen. I'm not preaching this to you. You guys, it doesn't, if it doesn't hit, if it, do, if it doesn't hit home, don't wear it. Come on, I'm just doing what God told me to do. He told me to preach this this afternoon because I wanted to come in here and just, you know, preach on the gifts and do miracles. And God, no, let's get the heart right. God said, let's get the heart right. Once the heart's right, it can sustain the move of the spirit. It won't corrupt, it won't pervert, it won't go to your head and pride won't creep up. Okay, point number eight. Oh, this is the worst. This is a harder one. Point number eight, chapter four, verse three. You ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives. You can pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And if you're praying what you want instead of what God wants, you don't ever get answers. And how do you know what God wants until your heart and his heart are the same? I don't need to go any farther there. Here's point number nine, chapter four, verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and spend a year there and make a profit and have business. And you go to the next who says, yet you do not know what your life will be tomorrow. You're just a vapor, blah, blah, blah. Instead, you ought to say if it's the Lord's will. Therefore, to one who knows what he ought to do and doesn't do it, to him it becomes sin. So here's point number nine. Most of the time, most of the time, most of the time, people's faith follows their financial position until their hearts are pure. When the job's secure, when the bank account has money, when the retirement's good, we got great faith. When all those things are kind of in jeopardy, our faith usually follows our pocketbook until our heart's pure. Wow. Amen? Amen? Because when your heart's pure, you know God's never going to leave you. And you know, he's probably got, you, he probably has a big make breakthrough miracle just in store. And that's why he's allowing you to go through that to perfect your faith a little more so you can handle it when he pours the blessing out. But when your heart's divided, all you do is, well, I better not give a very good offering because, you know, I'm struggling. Yay. Point number 10, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl. He misers you. Rich, okay. Here's this. Point number, uh, point number 10 is this. When your heart's divided, usually you use money to manipulate and get what you want in the church. When your heart's pure, you use money to build the kingdom where everybody flourishes around you in the church. When your heart's divided, you want credit for everything. When your heart's pure, you want to give God credit for everything. Now, I think God wants all Christians to be wealthy. But I also know that God can't give people things that they can't handle. So if all of our hearts were pure, it'd be easy for him to dump heaven out on us. Amen. Yes. Okay, point, point number 11. Um, that, that was 11. Let's do 12. Let's end with 12. Let's end with the baker's 12. Baker's dozen. Come on. Point number 12 is chapter 5. Listen to this. Chapter 5. Um, Verse 16. Now, let's start with 14. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders. They they can pray over him, anoint him with oil. 
in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effectual prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Amen. Point number 12. Until your heart's pure, you won't really have the ability to pray prayers of faith. You'll, you'll pray prayers of maybe he will, maybe he won't. Because you'll be more worried about whether he comes through or not and what's that make you look like if he doesn't. But once your heart's pure, you just believe the book. And you believe it's God's will to heal. And so you can actually pray prayers of faith instead of prayers of chance. Am I right? Okay, so I'm not going to leave you hanging there. I'm gonna, that's just, okay, let me, let me wrap the sermon up. Um, I, those 12 points describe me from age 17 to age 34 in the church. That was me. I didn't have deeds. I had good faith statements. I led Bible studies. I sang in singing groups. I was on the board. I never saw any miracles. I never led anybody to the Lord, but I invited people to church. I used people to get what I wanted. I knew how to, I, I knew how to be partial and pour into people that I thought would help my bottom line. Come on. My life was unstable, even though I didn't want to miss church. Come on. All 12 points. Just My prayers didn't get answered, so I didn't have much of a prayer life. I didn't have a pure heart. I love God. I wanted to go to heaven. I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't ever miss church. But those things still describe me. So in 1995, I was 34 years old, and I was so hungry to have victory. I don't like having a non-victorious Christian life. I don't want to survive. I want to thrive. Yeah. I don't want to just have life. I want to have it abundant. Yeah. And I, I read. I knew what the Bible said. I wasn't living it. I didn't experience it. You get it? And so I started praying this prayer because after a while, I got tired of going to church. You can only do stuff so long. You can't do holiness. You can't do righteousness. Come on, you can't do it. It's not, it's not the do attitudes. I mean, if you do stuff long enough, it just becomes doo-doo. Am I right? It's filthy rags, Paul calls it. So um, I started praying this prayer in 1995. God, if you can't take my lust away... Because I had lust. You see, it's one thing. It's a, it's a sad thing to go to church and worship and then talk behind people's back that you're trying to get an edge on and then to have lust and look at pornography and not just lust for sex, but lust for money and lust for power and lust for influence. And, and that creates shame and that creates fear. And I love God, but my heart was divided. I was born again but I wasn't sanctified yet. I'd been through the Reuben gate. I was a son, and I talked to God sometimes, but I never got to the Levi gate because me and God weren't one because I was afraid to be with him that close because I knew the stuff that was in me wasn't like him. Amen? So I started praying this prayer in January of 95. Lord, if you can't take this lust and this fear and this pride out of me, I'd rather die. And I meant it. And that's kind of like, in the, in the line of gates, you got to die to get into the promise. you got to be crucified with Christ. You can no longer live. Christ lives in you. What do you think crosses are for? They're not so you can be comfortable. They're so you can be dead to yourself and alive in Christ. Am I, am I right? So, so I started praying that prayer, and I remember I came home from work on June uh, 14th, and my wife read some bad news to me, and I couldn't handle it. I just threw the phone down. I snapped. I, I just collapsed at the kitchen table. I said, I can't go on anymore. I can't live anymore. I hit bottom. My wife looks at me, and she goes, Honey, why don't you just give up and trust God? Is that good advice? <laughs> Except it bugged me that she said it. <laughs> why are wives always right? I don't, I don't understand that, but... <laughs> Anyway, she said it, and I remember looking down the aisle of my little house, and my boy Chad was a fifth grader, my boy Chad Bohai, and he was crying looking at his dad because he didn't know why I was broken. And my whole life flashed before my eyes, 
And I remember when I was born again, when I was 14, I remember pursuing holiness, pursuing the cross, pursuing Jesus till I was 17, but I never had faith to believe God could give me a pure heart, and so it never happened, because it only happens by faith. It doesn't happen by goosebumps. It doesn't happen by falling out. It doesn't happen by a prayer language. Those are things you can do. You can't do holiness. It has to happen by faith. And when I didn't believe, it never happened. So from age 17 to age 34, I became a great churchian instead of a Christian. You get it? I never, I never wanted to walk away from God. I just settled for not having total victory. And most of the church is that way. So my wife says, why don't you give up and trust God? I went to bed, had a dream. I don't have a, lots of dreams. I'm not like, a lot of you people are real prophetic. I, my wife has dreams all the time. I don't. I don't know why. But anyway, she's prophetic. But I had a dream. I'm hanging on a cliff. I'm going to die. And right below me is Jesus. And he goes, just let go and let me catch you. I said, I'm afraid. I can't because I knew all the things in me weren't like him, and I was ashamed. I woke up, went to work. On the way to work, I got hit by a semi. Literally hit my truck, came through the passenger side of my four-door custom Ford Dually. It hit me and pushed me all the way out of the truck. The truck was doing about 55 when it hit me, the semi. I was going, I turned left, bam, I didn't see him. So um, I'd been praying, God, I want you to change me or kill me. (laughs) I changed my prayer life a little bit after that. (laughs) I don't know if he did that, but I think he could have stopped it. He could have stopped the truck. Come on. So anyway, I don't want to argue with you about that. I just know... I just know I took prayer a little more serious after I got hit by a semi. And I'd been saying, God, if you can't take this fear out of me, I'd rather die. And now I don't, I don't want to die because I'm already dead to self and alive in Jesus. I don't pray that anymore. You get it? So anyway, I'm I'm in the, I'm in the hospital and they're doing all these tests on me and I keep leaving my body and I, and I can see myself laying on the gurney and, and, and every time I'm looking down at myself, this angel grabs my shirt and says, don't leave us, Dan. We're not done with you yet. And I go back in my body and I ask for pain meds and they say, Mr. Bohai, we can't give you anything. Can you give us your phone number? And I couldn't remember my phone number. And they say, we can't give you meds until we find out all that's wrong with you. I said, well, I need, and then I would leave my body and I could see myself laying down there. I don't know where I was. It wasn't heaven. I was just looking down. And an angel kept grabbing me saying, don't leave. We're not done with you yet. It happened all day long. And I know why the angel kept visiting me. It's because my mom has clout. (laughs) When she prays, heaven listens. My mom, I'm just saying. Like when when Carolyn Bohai talks, heaven goes. Anyway, so I got through all the tests and they found out that my bottom four vertebrae were cracked. My pelvis was shattered and crushed. My liver was torn. And the urethra that comes out of your bladder, my urethra, where your urine comes out of your bladder, was ripped out of my bladder. I mean, it hit me hard, you guys. And so they put a catheter in my stomach. They got me out of all the CAT scans. They put me in the ICU. They started the morphine, and now it's evening. I've been in tests all day. And my wife wants all these, you know, visitors want to see me. And I was too afraid to see them. And I thought I hit rock bottom the night before, but now I'm really at rock bottom because in my life, not, I may not be like you guys, but in my life, when people would ask me, how are you doing? I would always just put on my mask. and say, I'm doing great. I'm busy. You know, work's good. I'm making money. And that, I always got my value out of what I could produce myself because I didn't have a pure heart. I wasn't satisfied in what God was doing, so I tried to get my own satisfaction by hard work. And, you know, I was a builder. I had 500 employees. I had millions of dollars. I, and that never satisfied. It just kept you always racing. Are you getting this? Yes. So, um, so anyway, uh, I said to my wife, I said, honey, I'm too afraid. I can't see anybody. First time in my life I haven't been able to put my mask on. 
And so she left, and I'm there in that room, you know, and all day long I've been having these encounters, you know, and I'm there alone in the ICU room, and I said, God, am I going to die? Is this, is this it? And I, I'll never forget this. I looked over at my heart monitor, you know, and it had your blood pressure and your heart beats and your oxygen, you know, the little box, like the TV. And I saw it go flat. It was 5.37 p.m. Jesus now comes up to my bed. It's not the angel. Jesus comes. He's right next to me. I can't see him, but I know it's him because he changed me. I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm going to tell you how I got my pure heart. I haven't recovered. I can't. I'm never going to be the same. You guys get this? So he says to me, son, I've forgiven your sins. I was so happy because my whole life I thought I had to earn it. You know, I thought I had to work at it. I thought I need to memorize scripture. I need to get to church. I need to pay my tithe, you know. But Jesus said, son, I've forgiven your sins. Now, faith comes by hearing, right? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. When Jesus tells you you're his son and you're forgiven, all of a sudden you realize what it means. Like, I have no condemnation. He accepts me like I'm in the family, right? That's what he said to me. And then he asked me a question. When will you trust me with your life? Now, he doesn't ask you a question because he doesn't know the answer. The night before, my wife goes, why don't you give up and trust God? In the dream the night before I got hit in the morning by the semi, in the dream, Jesus said, let go, I'll catch you. I see you, bed. 24 hours later, third time. When will you trust me with your life? I've already forgiven your sins. I want you. I knew I could. For the first time, I felt like I could trust him. And so I remember I just said yes. And this is what happened to me. Not in the physical. You know, it says in Romans 2 that circumcision is not of the physical heart. It's of the spiritual heart. When I said yes, that's all I said, yes. It seemed like his word cut me open. And he took out my lust and my fear and my shame and my anger and my insecurity. It's like he took it out of me. I don't know where he puts it. It stinks. Come on. Psalms 103 says he puts it somewhere as far as the east is from the west. That'd be like a big trash dump somewhere. I mean, it's big. So he takes all this dark gray stuff that I'm ashamed of out of me. And then he just filled me with his presence. I came too. I remember the lights were flashing. I remember the nurses were coming at me with shock paddles. My wife was crying. And I remember all I could say was, it's okay, Jesus is here. And I was fine. And I said to my wife, I said, honey, I want to see the, the, I want to see the visitor. She goes, what? I'm, I'm not afraid. And for the first time in my life, I experienced perfect love casting out all fear. Now, I can't work. I can't walk. My body, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know I have no fear. Come on, and that comes from your heart, you guys. Come on. And so the people come in my room, and they're looking at me, and I'm saying, Jesus came to me. He talked to me. He's in me. He's going to take care of me. I'm not going to be homeless. He's got my back. And he could do the same thing for you if you just give up your life. And they're all looking at me like I have three heads. They think, what happened to Dan? They, they know me. What are you talking about? And they all leave telling my wife, what happened to your husband? And she doesn't know what happened because she, she didn't have the encounter. She thinks it's the morphine. Come on. And, and so there I am, you guys. And in the, in, the fir, in, in the first week in the hospital, I led seven people to the Lord. Now, I had some deeds. I never had deeds. All I had was faith. And now I can't keep my mouth shut. And I remember when I got to go home from the hospital, I prayed for things to go wrong at my house so people would have to come visit me so I could witness to them. 
I'm not making any of this up, you guys. From, from June until Christmas in 1995, I led 181 people to the Lord. I had never led anybody to the Lord until I said yes, and he took all the stuff that was in me that made me feel ashamed out, and he filled me with all of him, and now I can't stop talking about him. I mean, I used to leave church early to get to the kickoff of the chiefs. I used to leave church early to get to the kings or the, the royals. I had season tickets, and after that encounter with Jesus, I didn't care about any of that stuff. It's like, I don't know how God did He changed my desires. He changed my desires. How does he do that? It's like when he, when he, cleansed, when he cleansed me and purified me, guys, he moved me to want to follow him. I don't even have to work at it. It's not hard. <laughs> uh, and so many people struggle with faith and feelings. And when's God going to give me my season? When's this? And it's, if your heart was pure, your season would be, man, Jesus lives in me. <laughs> Yay. So, um, I'm, I'm home, and I have a bunch of surgeries, and after one of my surgeries, it's two in the morning, I'm laying there in my hospital bed in pain, and, and the Holy Spirit says, you know, I've taken care of your soul, and I've taken care of your family, and I've given you peace, I could heal your body right now if you just reach out and touch me. The Holy Spirit said it just like that, it's two in the morning. And I just remember, I put my hands up, I didn't know what to do, how do I touch you? I'm in a hospital bed, how do I touch you? <laughs> I just put both hands, I just raised both hands. I just felt this presence of warmth, you know, and, and all of a sudden, listen to this, you guys need to hear this. All of a sudden, I felt my back go, and my pelvis that was crushed and twisted, and they never had to put metal pins in any of my bones, and the doctor still can't explain what happened, except he healed me. And... And, and so then, listen to this, then about two years goes by and I've been going into five prisons a week because I had fire in my bones. And I need people to know this Jesus and people in the church, it was like, they were a little afraid. <laughs> Literally. But people in prison are hungry because they're captive and they just, they want to hear hope. And I help, I, I help pray with over 8,000 people that wanted Jesus. I had deeds you get it? Not just faith statements, not just attendance. Things were happening. And I, I couldn't do them. But the Holy Spirit had somebody he could work through. So two years goes by. And I remember I was praying, reading my Bible, praying. I was like, Jesus, what did you do to me? Because nobody could tell me. How do you tell somebody, well, this is when you said yes? I mean, how do you, how do you explain it theologically? Because I wasn't at a service. There was no preacher. There was no music. There was no offering. There was no Bible. I was in a hospital bed. And I said yes, and I'm not recovering. In fact, I can't get over it. It's getting worse. I, I love him more every day. It's, 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 and so I'm asking him, what did you do to me, Jesus? What did you do to me? I mean... I'm not recovered. This is like, what did you do? And I remember, I just remember, he was like he chuckled. And he said, oh, son, that's when I purified your heart. And I remember saying to him, well, Jesus, everybody needs this. It's like I'm trying to give God advice, right? <laughs> <laughs> and when I said that to him, I felt like he chuckled again. And because he loves me and I felt like he chuckled, but he, I can't prove it. I just felt like I could see him chuckling. And, and he said, I know that's why I died. And then I started studying the scripture because once he tells you that you want to find it in the Bible. So you don't think it's just your imagination. And what I found in the Bible is there's 25 verses that say you need to be born again or adopted, or justified, or regenerated, right? To, 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 to get in the family of God, to be forgiven. There's 25 verses. There's over 600 verses 
that talk about the need for believers to be purified and sanctified and cleansed and made holy and 25 verses to get in the family of God, 611 verses to get the same pure heart of God. Whoa. I wonder which one he wants more emphasis on. 25, 611, same book. And nobody ever preaches about the 611. They just preach about the 25, and they wonder why everybody's unstable. They wonder why no counties ever grow in born-again believers. They wonder why everybody has problems struggling with hate and anger and offense and pornography. And when the answer's in, get the nature and character and purity of Christ to become who you are, he doesn't have issues. I'm preaching so good. I'm not, I am. So... Two years, I found out what happened to me after two years. So you can have an experience and not even know what it is. So aren't you glad your mind doesn't have to outthink your heart's experience? Amen? So after I found out what happened, I started telling people it's possible. And I remember all four of my teenagers. Josh is my youngest son. He's 34. He's Chad's youngest brother. I have two, two daughters and two sons. After they saw dad different for two years, and I started telling them, oh, it's because I got a pure heart, kids. They all wanted it too. Now tell me, that doesn't change your home dynamic when teenagers get pure hearts. Come on. Then my wife wanted a pure heart. My brother Doug wanted a pure heart. My two sisters wanted a pure heart. 18 of my cousins wanted a pure heart. One of my uncles wanted a pure heart. And they didn't want it because I was a good preacher. They wanted it because they saw a new person, and they wanted what I had. It changed the whole family. Are you guys getting this? And so, and so I, I, I just remember, I just remember this. I remember um, in 2007, the housing market crashed, right? Remember, like all house values went down across the nation and, you know, it was the biggest house crash ever in the history of America. And we're going to have another one, but that's the big one so far. And I remember I lost $15 million, literally, I lost it. My wife and I sold our wedding rings. We sold our retirement. We sold everything we own. We, we just lost everything because we were builders and we had $65 million borrowed. And it was no big deal when we we're making millions, but when everything stops. But I didn't lose my peace. Come on, I didn't lose joy. How do you know this pure heart experience is even possible? Because when all hell's breaking loose, heaven's coming out of you. Come on, you guys. I'm not trying to commit suicide. I don't need counseling. Before that experience in the hospital, I wouldn't have made it. Are you guys getting this? So I remember in 08, after you know, I lost everything, and I didn't know what to do. I'm 48 years old now. It was 12 years ago. I said, God, what am I supposed to do? All I've ever been is an entrepreneur. I don't, what do you want me to do? And I'm, I'll never forget this. He goes, buy a new Bible and read it. I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> buy a new Bible. So I got a new King James, 1187 pages, black leather. I read it in two weeks because I want to hear. I think life's in the voice. I want to hear. What am I supposed to do? I didn't hear nothing, so I turned around. I was in Jackson, Wyoming, reading. I went there and read eight hours a day, and just on the way home, I'm kind of discouraged because I don't know what I'm supposed to do because we're out of anything to live on. Literally lost everything. I had 308 rental homes, all gone. I had a house in Breckenridge, a house on the Ozarks, two houses in LA, all gone. Everything's gone. You get it? I don't know what I'm going to do. When I say that, I'm not trying to like make a, I'm not exaggerating. So I'm driving home to, I don't know what I'm driving home to. I stopped in Laramie, Wyoming at the Shell station to gas up. I hung up the gas pump. Holy Spirit speaks to me. I want you to preach the gospel until you die, period. And then he said, this is what I want you to preach about. I want you to wake up the church of Jesus Christ to the power, the purity and the freedom of the spirit-filled life <laughs> at a gas station. 
So you guys can't talk me out. I don't care if you don't give me a dollar. I don't give a rip because I'm not compelled by your offering. I'm compelled by the love of God. And he actually told me, you have to do this till you die so it's easy. <laughs> Come on, life's in the voice, right? And so you know, I've traveled everywhere. I've been everywhere. And, and my family loves the Lord. And I have 15 grandkids. There's one of my grandkids. There's my son-in-law, Jason. He loves the Lord. I mean, my family loves the Lord. You get it? And so I, here's my question. Do you have a pure heart? That's a good question. Right? I don't mean if you're a Christian. I think everybody that comes to church on Monday night's a Christian. I mean, I, I don't think people came in here, well, I think I want, I want to slip in here and see if I can be a sinner. And no, I don't think you do that. I think you come because you like God and you want to be more like your father. That's why you're here. That's not the question. The question is not, are you one that went to the upper room? The question is, are you one that stayed until you were baptized in the fire? It's one thing to go. It's another one to stay until your heart's made pure by faith. And you say, well, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, that means your heart's not purified because the Spirit bears witness to you. Come on, you guys. Hebrews 10, 14 says, He has forever made holy those He has sanctified, and the same Spirit bears witness to this. And usually the witness of the Spirit is you have such joy and such peace and such satisfaction and such calm, and you're at rest, and you're not striving, and you have love, and you're not offended. And you don't need somebody to give you a break. I mean, there's a witness of the Spirit. And His Word is a plumb line, and it doesn't fall crooked to make exceptions, right? His, his Word is a plumb line on everybody's heart in this room right now. And you know whether your heart's pure or not because the Spirit's telling you. You say, well, how do I get a pure heart? I don't say yes. When God came to me and He said, I, I want your life. I don't want to just forgive you of the stuff that's wrong. I want you. Right? It's like Romans 12. I want you to give me yourself as a living sacrifice. I'll use it. And your life will be my will. Are you guys getting this? Isn't this a good message? So you guys get it. Those 12 things described me for my whole life until I was 34 and a half. And I loved God. But my heart was divided. And after Jesus gave me a pure heart, it's like all those things slowly took care of themselves. And they don't describe me anymore. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and so um, I remember when Daniel was in college, Daniel Rage, and I preached on purity and God purified his heart. He's never been the same. Once his heart was made pure, he went on a quest for the supernatural. He goes to Bethel. He comes here. He does all these, you know, everyday church. It started when God got his heart pure. You guys get this? So we have to start with holiness before healing becomes a natural way of life that doesn't pervert us and make us proud. You get it? And so... If the Spirit's bearing witness to you that this is what he's been wanting to do forever, that's a good sign, right? No one can come to Jesus unless the Spirit's drawn them. John 6, 44 and 65, come on. And so even if you hear a good message where the guy's kind of a charismatic and he's a good spirit, no. It's not your choice, it's his choice. You have to respond to his drawing. He doesn't force people into holiness. He's irresistible. He draws us by his love. Am I right, you guys? Sometimes people say, oh, you're just being legalistic. I'm the last thing that's legalistic. I don't do anything because I have to. I do everything because I can't help it. Because it's my desire now. He changed my desires, you guys. I used to struggle with porn, you guys, and lust. It's like it makes me sick now. He changed my heart. Do you guys get this? It wasn't 12 steps. It was one step. I went all in. 
And so I want to give people a chance tonight to get pure hearts. Because I know what happened to my family tree. And what if, what if we had a revival of families? To where marriages and kids and grandkids and uncles and aunts. and I mean, it would change the world. And what if everybody in this room got a pure heart and everybody that you have influence over would say, what happened to you? And why do you have love now? Why do you have faith? And why, why are you not mad? And, and then you can say, well, I don't know. I heard this guy from Kansas and it kind of made sense. And so I trusted God and he changed me. I think it's that simple. You guys with me? So I don't expect all of you to want a pure heart, but man, if one or two of you in this church would really have this experience... It could change all of the five cities. Yay. That's what I believe. And so I'm going to give you a chance. This is what I want to do. Because there's not room for everybody to come up here and do this. I mean, we don't have room. That's a good problem. Come on. But maybe if you feel the tug on your heart and you feel the Holy Spirit saying, you've been fighting battles that you don't need to fight. I've won all the battles. You just need to let me be your Lord and not just your Savior. You just need to let me rule everything and you quit trying to micromanage. Just give up control and let me come and fill you with everything that I am and so you no longer live, but I live through you. His life is very successful. It's just giving up your life, you guys. And if you want to do that tonight, by faith, come on. This is by faith, right? Isn't Christianity by faith? We're not a works people. We're by faith. I promise you, you guys, since 1995, I've never been the same person. I haven't been perfect in performance, but I've been perfect in my passion for Jesus. I've never wanted to give up, ever. He changed me. And so if you want a pure heart tonight because you feel the Holy Spirit drawing you to be crucified, then I just want you to stand where you're at. Would you do that? If you want a pure heart, just a cleansed, pure, holy heart. Hmm. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for a church that opens its doors in a pandemic because they want more. But Lord, we don't want pride. We don't want pride to have a place to exist. We don't want lust to have a place to be comfortable. We don't want fear to have a place to take root and brood in our lives. Lord, there's so much stuff in this world that causes anxiety. We need a greater reality. And so Lord, if there's secret sins, if there's secret lust, if there's secret hatred, or we don't want secrets. We want to be in the light tonight. We just want to be in you, man, and use freedom. And so, God, I pray that you give us the faith that's pure, that if we can believe you can heal a cancer and we can believe that you can forgive a sin, would you give us some childlike faith that we could believe that you could cleanse a heart? Would you give us enough faith to believe that the blood is powerful enough, not just to forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? The blood's powerful enough to do both. Not just forgive us, but to cleanse us and to change us forever. And that's what we want. That's why we're standing here. We want our families to be different. We want our lives to be different. We want to shine bright. We want to reflect Jesus. And so, Father, I ask you to cleanse everybody here. Sanctify us. Purify us. And don't let us argue, well, it's a process. Well, Lord, the process needs to start. I mean, you can be dying for 100 years, but there's a moment you're dead. Come on. 
We can't grow out of an oak into an elm tree. We need a nature change, God. We can't grow out of carnality into purity. We need you to supernaturally purify our hearts tonight. It's not something that happens by osmosis. It's not a growth. It's like we believe and you do it. And then we grow in grace and we grow in maturity and we grow in faith. Come on, we grow in confidence. But when our hearts are pure, our growth is not impeded. It's actually like the growth speeds up because we're cooperating, because our hearts are one. We're in the Levi gate. And now all of a sudden, we just want to praise constantly because our hearts are the same. And we don't want to whine. We want to worship. We don't want to complain. We just want to exalt our Jesus. Come on, you guys. And so receive your pure heart by faith. Come on. Receive it by faith tonight. Receive a pure heart by faith. Receive it by faith. No self-centeredness. Come on. No fear. Just freedom. In Jesus' name. Do you receive that? How many receive it by faith? Amen? Okay, you guys sit down. I want to give you a few instructions. Come on. And they're recording this. They're recording this. Come on. You're recording this, right, guys? Because they need to listen probably this a dozen times, right? Because it's good meat. It's not milk. Meat's good. I'm not a vegetarian. I like steak. Amen? Come on. Who likes steak? Okay. So, so I, want, I want to give you some instructions on what to do. Come on. I want to give you instructions. You say, well, I don't know. Dan, I don't feel. Well, show me a verse that says you're sanctified by feeling. It's not in the Bible. Acts 26, 18 says you're sanctified by faith. Hebrews 6, 12 says you receive the promises of God by faith and perseverance. In other words, you just can't have a moment of faith and say, well, if you didn't do it, God, I guess you're not strong enough. Keep persevering. Keep believing. How long do you pray for someone for healing until they're healed? Come on, you guys. Here's a, here's a, here's a very important part. You say, well, I don't know, Dan, I don't know. Well, keep asking him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Zechariah, I mean, uh, Luke 7, 13. Just keep asking him. Just keep asking him. Well, how many times should I ask him? Until you know. <laughs> here's another verse. It's very important, you guys. Acts 5, 32. It says he gives the Holy Spirit to everyone who obeys him. Because if you want to know what God's love language is, it's obedience. That's pretty simple. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Come on. 1 John 2, 3 says, this is how I'll know if you're even a Christian. You obey my commands. I don't want to quote them all. I'm not preaching another message. I'm just trying to give you instructions. Don't go out here and say, well, I don't know if I feel any different. I didn't feel much the night I got hit by a semi. I've never recovered from it. It was by faith. Come on. And so I think there's potential here in Pearl Chapel to change this whole area, you guys. Come on. Don't you guys want to be the revival center? So what I want to focus on tomorrow night is healing and deliverance. I'm going to focus on that. So if you know people that need it, bring them, right? I will tell you this much. When your heart's pure, it makes it easier for God to bring deliverance and healing to you. Because when your heart's pure, your motives want to trust God and his word. Isn't that good news? That's why Isaiah 53, 5, it's that order. It's forgiveness, it's cleansing, it's deliverance, then it's healing. Come on, you're forgiven, your iniquity's cleansed, your mind is set free and delivered so you can receive healing. Aren't you glad it's that order? And tonight we dealt with the cleansing. Yay, come on you guys, if you knew. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want you to be so happy, I really do. So uh, I, I asked Roger and Roxanne, you know, they said, how long would I preach? I'm done preaching. And they said, well, we'd like to be done by 9.30 or 10. Well, we're done. We're done early, come on. But tomorrow night, I really believe God's gonna do lots of miracles. I believe that. I've never been to services where he doesn't. And never in my life. 
And so I'm really believing for a lot of supernatural activity tomorrow night. Um, I believe generational curses will be broken. I believe a lot of the strongholds that keep your mind from not wanting to believe in areas will change. I, I just can see it happening already. And, and there'll be a lot of physical healings. It's just going to be good. Um, so I'm happy. And Roger and Roxanne, you didn't know me, but thanks for letting me come. Amen. Um, amen. Amen. Amen.